Ah, I see her. Okay. Did you think I forgot about you guys? We're excited. We, you, you missed all the jokes. <laughs> and, and you don't want them repeated. No. Uh-oh. Were they mean? No, no. No, they were uh, right. we we're just tapping our toes. <laughs> okay. Um uh, Today we have uh, Dr. Rachel Albright and Stu. I'll let you do the introductions. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Albright. Yep, um, from me, thank you very much, Dr. Albright. Um, <coughs> welcome, welcome to uh, Senior Men's Group. Uh, looking forward to your presentation. Um, for the guys, uh, Dr. Albright will be discussing a variety of common foot problems ranging from uh, toenail fungus to uh, painful bunions. She'll also provide general foot health tips and be happy to answer any questions at the end. So uh, as normal, save your questions for the end and we'll um, do our normal hand raising then. So we're looking forward to you. what you got to say, Doc. Um, you're on. Perfect. So I'm just gonna share my screen with you guys. Can you put her on speaker or using that to do that? I'm hoping you'll be able to see this. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Yes. Yes, you can. Yes. Okay. All right. So um, yeah, I'm Rachel Albright. I currently work at Stanford Health. I have an office in Darien as well as Wilton. And I'm going to just talk to you guys about some basic, you know, foot health. Um, maybe some of you are going through these things. Maybe some of you aren't. Um, if I don't go through something that you want to hear about, please let me know because I'm happy to, you know, deviate um, to where you guys need. Um, so I'm just going to just briefly touch on what a podiatrist is because I think that sometimes there's a little bit of uncertainty. Um, so, you know, a podiatrist is a foot and ankle specialist. We, we're not MDs. I have a doctor of podiatric medicine, so it's a DPM, but we specialize in all conditions pertaining to the foot and ankle. So anything that you have going on, whether it's a skin condition, if it's a circulation problem, if you have numbness in the feet, joint pain, if you had a trauma, broken bone, et cetera, we actually deal with everything regarding the foot and ankle. Um, basically from the knee down is a pretty good you know, area to uh, cut it off at. But anything that you have going on down there, we can take care of. Our training is um, four years of undergraduate degree. So we do have a bachelor's degree before we go into medical school. And then medical school is four years. And then we do three years of a surgical residency. So um, a couple years ago, maybe like 20 years ago, the residencies were not surgical and podiatry has moved into being all surgical in residencies. So it's three years of surgery and then fellowships are optional based on the person. And then you take your typical state licensing exam. So my training, um, I got my bachelor's from the University of South Florida. So, and if any of you guys are uh, Florida fans, you know, I'm born and raised in Florida. I got my doctorate at Rosalind Franklin in Chicago, and I did my residency in Chicago as well. So two of the level one trauma centers there, and that's where I studied surgery. And then I did my fellowship at Dartmouth College. I got a master's um, at Dartmouth as well, and I'm currently board certified in podiatric medicine. So that's just a little bit about me. So, you know, I'm sure it's no um, surprise. The foot changes when we age, right? Our feet, when we get older, are not the same feet that we have when we're young. And one of those reasons is because, you know, we actually have changes in our skin. The collagen and the elastin in our skin tends to kind of become thinner and break down a little bit. This causes thick skin to happen. Some of us might see calluses forming on the skin. We might notice changes to our joints and muscles. Uh, we're not quite as limber as we used to be, not quite as flexible. And our foot also might change size and shape as we age. Many people say that their shoe size becomes a little bit bigger. They might notice that their arch is a little bit flattened out. 
And that's all because of changes in collagen and also changes to the joints and the soft tissue structures. So why is foot health important? There's a lot of reasons why foot health is important, especially when we get older. Um, it has been proven in the medical literature that older adults with foot pain and foot deformities are more likely to experience a fall or have some kind of instability when they're walking. Falls can be a huge problem. Um, it's actually considered a public health burden. You know, there's billions of dollars spent in a year on caring for people who have falls because falls can lead to really severe things, head injuries, fractures, um, being in the hospital, and then having to undergo long extensive rehab, and then sometimes losing your functionality and your independence in the community. So falls can be a really serious problem. There's a lot of effort to prevent falls. And we've found that, you know, if you have foot pain or foot deformity, those things should be treated so that we can prevent you from having um, an injurious fall in the future and prevent you from having functional loss. Um, foot pain can also impair your physical ability and just your overall functional status in the community. I'm sure we've all experienced this kind of regardless of age, right? I mean, if we have foot pain, we're not gonna wanna walk as much, maybe not run our errands as much. And um, this lack of physical ability is going to lead to weight gain, um, reduced heart function. If we're not exercising our cardiovascular health, it can lead to falls, like I mentioned before, um, increased joint pain, et cetera. So foot health is very important at all ages. Um, so I'm just gonna go into some common foot problems. Um, bunions in particular, you know, this is something I deal with very, very commonly. Toenail issues is another thing that we see all the time. And I'm just gonna briefly talk about diabetes as well because that's a really important condition that affects us, you know, more as we age. So it's kind of important to just go into that a little bit. And then I'll give you guys some tips at the end. So bunions, uh, this is a really good example of what a bunion looks like, this person right here. Um, it basically forms from abnormal balance in the foot. So the force is being pulled over the um, this big toe here and this joint is abnormal and it's causing a disruption of the joint and it's causing that joint to actually deviate. So that's really what a bunion is. Um, there is thought to be a genetic component to this. So sometimes, you know, this can be inherited and be familial, but, you know, sometimes it's caused by unsupportive shoe gear. Um, we, it's really important to have a nice rigid sole on the bottom because it helps your joints just function a little bit more effectively. And if your shoe is not very supportive, it can definitely lead to increased motion at joints that shouldn't be having that much motion and that can lead to bunions. Um, Narrow-toed shoes can also aggravate the symptoms and lead to bunions as well. So this is a really good um, example of the bones on the inside for bunions. So this, you know, picture on the left, it's normal anatomy. So this toe is nice and straight. Those joints are just right on top of each other. The bones are just right on top. But then you look to the right and you can see that that toe is just kind of deviated off of that joint there. So it's actually a joint problem. The joints are not straight, they're not aligned, and there's deviation or what we call subluxation of the joint, and it causes that big bump to happen on the side of the foot there. Um, people might experience redness, swelling, pain at that joint. You might get coins or calluses, irritation, and a lot of people will have painful or some kind of restrictive joint motion at that big toe joint and that'll cause pain. So what can you do for a bunion at home? So if you have a bunion, um, many people will use bunion pads, okay? These are just accommodative pads. Oh, sorry, we'll get into that in a second. They're just accommodative pads that go over that big bump that go into your shoes. Now, the problem with that is it takes up space in the shoe. So it might make your, your shoes seem a little, um, tighter. But bunion pads can help, wider shoe gear. There's really no way to get a, to avoid wider shoe gear. If you have a deformity in your foot, you have to buy shoes that are going to accommodate the deformity you have. So wide shoe gear is a must. Some people will apply ice packs to reduce the swelling. And if the pain and symptoms persist, then it's time to see your doctor. 
So some things that your doctor can offer, um, again, is gonna be paid, uh, padding and taping. This is to help minimize the pain and help to encourage a more normal foot position. These are um, some common you know, bracing techniques that can be used where you're just kind of pulling that toe into a more normal position. But I do wanna note that these do not cure the deformity. So it's a joint problem where the joint is abnormal and using a brace to push the joint straight is not going to fix the joint completely. It's just going to help with symptoms while you're wearing the brace. And as soon as you take the brace off, the toes just gotta pop back to where it was. So these braces are not cures. They're just kind of something to help with some symptoms people may be feeling. Um, Anti-inflammatories can be very helpful. This is typically a condition where the inflammation levels are high in that joint. So sometimes we'll put a little steroid injection into the joint to try to help you. Again, that's not a cure. It's just to kind of make you feel a little bit better. Physical therapy can help. Um, it can improve the range of motion of that joint. It can also strengthen the muscles and tendons around that joint and just make you feel overall more confident. Um, so I have had some success with physical therapy. Orthotics um, can be very helpful. Typically, that's one of the first line treatments that we offer. And an orthotic is going to be a nice rigid sole that we place inside of your shoe. Nobody knows that you're wearing it, but it allows your foot to function more efficiently. And the more efficiently your foot is functioning, typically the less pain you're gonna have in that area. So those are some conservative treatments. Now, surgery is the only way to make the joint normal again. Um, there's really no evidence to say that these conservative treatments are going to fix that joint. They might just help it feel a little bit better, but if you want that toe straight again, surgery is the best option. Um, Surgery consists of removing that big bony prominence on the side, and it's going to restore, restore normal alignment and relieve pain. So that is the goal of surgery. So we're gonna just switch gears here a little bit to uh, nail fungus. Um, <laughs> this is something we see commonly. It, um, I, I don't wanna say everyone deals with it because that's not true, but it almost feels like everyone deals with it. That's how common it is, okay? So don't feel bad if you have it because we just see it all the time. So what is it? It's an infection of the toenail, but it's actually a fungal infection. It's not a bacteria. So an antibiotic is not gonna help with this because it's a different mechanism that's causing the nail to get thick like this. So, um, Antibiotics, you know, are not gonna be helpful. It's gonna be an antifungal that you're looking for to treat this. It really affects all people the same. You know, there aren't really people that are necessarily more prone to getting this than others. Symptoms are gonna be thickening of the nail. The nail can change shape, change color. Some people will be a little bit more prone to an ingrown toenail where the nail grows into the skin because the nail is changing shape. You might notice some debris underneath the nail. And sometimes people can have pain because when that nail gets really thick, it's hitting the top of the shoe and that constant pressure on that nail can cause a lot of discomfort. So sometimes um, nail fungus can actually lead to pain. So the treatment for this <laughs> depends on the person. There is topical and oral treatments um, on the market for this. Now, oral treatments are more effective than topicals, but they also have side effects. So the side effects of the oral treatment is it can affect your liver function. It's cleared by the liver. So the liver is more prone to getting a little dysfunctional if you use this medicine. Now, it's a long course too. It's three months. You have to use the medicine for three months, every day for three months before you're gonna see any kind of relief. And so we do test your liver function. Um, my personal, what I personally do is I will just check your last lab that maybe you had with your primary doctor, make sure your liver is normal. And then I will check it one time in the middle of your treatment, make sure it stays normal. If it stays normal, you can continue the treatment and finish the three months. And that's the protocol that I use. Some doctors check it more often than that, but I feel like just checking it once sometime in the course is fine. So uh, that's the oral medicine. It's, um, it's called Lamisil. It's pretty effective, but it does take a while to work. You have to take it for at least three months and you definitely can't cut it off early. <laughs> um, topical medicines. Now these are a lot safer. 
Um, there's really not many side effects to them at all. They're very easy to use. You're just gonna paint it on the nail like a nail polish, but it's clear. So there's no color to it. And you just paint it on every single day. Now, the thing with the topicals is it takes really forever to see a difference. You're gonna have to use the topical every day persistently and you're not gonna see any difference in the nail color for about four to six months. Um, that's because we're waiting for the nail to actually grow out. Um, that's when we're really seeing changes. So we're waiting for the nail to grow out right from the base. And from the base, we're hoping it's gonna grow clear and that's where you're gonna notice the clearance. So toenails take kind of a, a long time to grow they take much longer than fingernails and that's why it takes so long. So um, definitely patience is a virtue with toenail fungus. Um, caring for these at home, you know, you want to try to keep the nail thinner if you can. Um, the thickness can really add to the discomfort that you feel and it can also add to a little bit of trauma. If the nail is hitting the shoe, it can actually cause the nail to get thick from trauma as well. So you wanna to try to keep the thickness down and that's something that your doctor can help you with. They can actually take some of those thickened layers down for you and make it more manageable. And you always wanna cut your nails straight across. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a little while. But take home messages for toenail fungus is treatment takes a very long time. Um, I wouldn't expect any changes in the nail for about five to six months. Probably the biggest thing that I see is um, people will say, oh, I used this over the counter and I used it for two weeks and I didn't see any difference. And, you know, you, you got to use it longer than that. <laughs> These are going to take a really long time to see changes. So um, definitely, you know, patience is virtue, persistence is key. Um, some of you might be wondering, are the over-the-counter options viable? Like, are those good options? And yeah, they are. I mean, some of the over-the-counter ones really do work, but the key is patience and it's really the longevity of the use. So. Um, another toenail topic that we see very often is ingrown toenails. So <laughs> here's some good examples of some ingrown toenails. Um, kind of gross looking, I know. And what it is, is it's when the nail grows into the skin. And there's gonna be two reasons why this happens. Um, some people are a little bit more prone to having the nail grow into the skin. So it's just gonna grow in there kind of naturally and they're a little bit more prone to having this problem over and over. But other people, it's gonna happen because their shoe gear is actually encouraging this problem. If you have tight shoe gear that's pushing on the side of the toe, it's going to encourage the skin to grow over the toe and that can cause some ingrown toenails. So those are the two biggest reasons why I see this happening. Either somebody's prone to it in the first place or their shoe gear is really contributing to them getting this problem. Um, people with diabetes are particularly somebody that we worry about a little bit because they don't have a great immune system to care for if this nail gets infected. So if you have diabetes and you have an ingrown toenail, you should definitely get it looked at by a doctor probably sooner than later because it can turn into a more severe problem if it's not treated properly. The big toe is definitely the most common toe that's involved. Um, I've definitely seen it in all the toes, second, third, fourth, but the big toe is definitely the most common. So this is usually self-diagnosed. Uh, most people know when they have an ingrown toenail, they know that that's the problem. So that is one nice thing about it. You don't necessarily need a doctor to tell you that it's an ingrown toenail. Usually you can tell yourself. If you're looking for some things um, to do at home, we're gonna get into that in the next slide. But uh, most people are gonna experience pain, swelling, redness, and it's all gonna be on the side of the nail plate. When you start to see drainage, that's a good indication that there might be an infection there. Um, and that you might need a little bit of extra help with it. So self-care, a lot of people have had really good success with warm Epsom salt baths. Now, the idea behind this is that the salt water bath is going to pull any drainage out from that nail border that's in there. So if you're starting to get an infection and you're noticing a little bit of drainage in that border, the warm Epsom salt bath is going to pull that drainage out for you and help you maybe eradicate the infection on your own. 
So this is a really good first step. It's also soothing, you know, people like these warm baths, they feel good, they kind of de-stress you as well. So it's a nice uh, thing to add to your regimen. It's not harmful in any way. Um, antibiotic ointment to the area can help um, soothe any infection that's starting to occur. Wider shoe gear. So again, shoe gear that is narrow, that is causing the skin to grow up over the nail, we're going to want to change our shoe gear and make sure that our shoes are wide enough where that's not happening and encouraging the problem to continue. Sometimes a nail procedure is indicated if self-care is not successful. So if you're doing warm Epsom salt baths and antibiotic ointment to the area and it's still red and it's swollen and it still hurts, you probably need a little bit more help. And that's when you might need a nail procedure. So nail procedures, this is an example of what that would be. So these are called nail avulsion procedures. On the right hand side, this is a partial nail avulsion. So you can see this person is kind of holding the piece of the nail in their instrument here and they pulled that from underneath the skin. They actually pulled that out from underneath the skin. That's how much nail sometimes is caught underneath the skin. And you can see from this photo that that's not gonna go away unless that nail is pulled out, right? Sometimes we need to get right to the base of the problem and we need to get rid of it from the source. So um, this picture on the left kind of shows the process here. You're just going, basically what the doctor does is they will numb you up for this, okay? This is <laughs> not something they wouldn't keep you comfortable for, but your toe gets numbed up. They just lift that portion of the nail from underneath the skin and they just cut a sliver of it out. So the picture on the right that actually has a real toe and not a cartoon toe, that's about how much of the sliver they're gonna take. So the nail looks largely normal still, it's just a small sliver that they're taking out. Now the picture that shows this little cotton swab, this little Q-tip, this is a demonstration of what we call a chemical matricectomy. That is actually for people that have this problem over and over and over. We can put a little chemical on that corner of the nail that we remove and we use that to kill the nail plate so that um, it also kills the nail root where the nail grows from so that that piece of nail can never grow back. So when I see people come back two or three times with this same problem, I usually recommend to get this procedure done, we'll kill the nail root, and that little sliver of nail will never grow back. It does make your nail a little bit more narrow. It's not going to be quite as wide as it was before the procedure, but essentially if you get that procedure done, you'll never have the problem again. So sometimes it's really worthwhile. Um, so preventing this problem in the future, there is a right and wrong way to cut your toenails. Um, we wanna cut them straight across. Um, we don't want to angle them. Um, that is going to encourage an ingrown to happen. Now, when we cut it straight across, sometimes we'll notice that the corners of the nail will be kind of sharp. So you're gonna to wanna to take a nail file and just round those corners off. And that's how you're gonna to want to make that more comfortable for yourself. But you're not gonna to wanna to take an instrument and just cut into that corner, okay? That's definitely how I've seen some ingrowns happen. I had um, one you know, young boy, he's about 12 years old, he cuts his own nails. And every time he just slants them in the corner, he's had like five ingrowns and I've done like five different procedures on him. And I was like, we need to have a lesson on how to cut your toenail. <laughs> so um, it definitely helps to cut them straight across to prevent this from happening. So um, switching gears a little bit into diabetes. Um, this is a very common problem. If you know, every one of us probably know at least one person that has diabetes. You know, it's a very common disease. Um, it's a disease that... So that's one of the reasons why I'm going to kind of touch on it today. Um, basically, diabetes is abnormal usage of sugar in the body. So having high levels of sugar in the body is actually toxic to the body. So it affects your blood vessels and your circulation. It affects the nerves and it affects your immune system. 
and other parts of the body as well. So people that have high sugars constantly on a high level, their immune system's actually not working quite as well. And they're not able to fight off infection as well as somebody who did not have diabetes. Um, there's actually some medical literature to say that if your sugar is above 150, your immune system is probably not working very well. And for somebody with diabetes, 150 actually doesn't sound that bad. They're probably thinking, well, that's actually a pretty good sugar. It's actually not. I mean, it's kind of abnormal, right? So um, there's a lot of things that diabetes can you know, contribute to as far as complications. It definitely affects everybody. Um, it doesn't matter if you're like where you came from or anything like that, it's, it, it affects everybody. And what does it mean for the foot in particular? So what I'm looking for as a physician in the foot is I'm looking for, do you have any decreased blood flow? Because it affects the circulation. So we affect your circulation. Do you have any loss of sensation in your feet? Um, that's gonna be a nerve problem. It's called neuropathy. When the nerves get a little bit dull and you can't feel your feet as well as you used to feel them. So that's gonna be a loss of sensation in the feet. Some people feel tingling, burning, other people just feel numb or they feel like their feet just feel strange. Like they'll say, you know, the covers on my feet feel weird and I don't really know why. Those are all signs of possibly um, the early signs of neuropathy. Changes in the skin integrity. So diabetes can cause the skin to break down a little bit easier. It can cause increased dry skin. I notice a lot of my um, adults with diabetes have really dry skin. That's actually stemming from a nerve problem as well. Um, when the nerves are not working very well, it's very hard for the body to regulate the body temperature and to know if you need moisture or not in your skin. So a lot of people will have really dry skin because they're not able to regulate their body temperature very well. And that's actually a sign of neuropathy um, as well. I see a lot of atrophy of the muscles in the foot. So where the muscles are not very strong, um, there's weakness going on in the foot. This leads to you know, instability when people walk. It can lead to balance problems and falls. And um, my adults with diabetes tend to have an increased risk of infection. And that's just from that high sugar that we talked about earlier. So um, what do all these things mean? So we talked about circulation, nerves, all these things. So the, basically it comes down to a greater risk of foot ulcers. Okay, foot ulcers are the biggest problem somebody with diabetes is gonna have. And you know, infection. So a foot ulcer is basically breakdown of the skin where you have a wound on the foot. Now, this is gonna happen because there are changes in the foot architecture as you age, just normally, everyone has this. But if you have diabetes, um, your skin integrity might not be as good as somebody who doesn't have it. And it's going to put you at an, at, an increased risk of that skin to kind of break down. When you have a lack of sensation, so if your nerves are not working very well, if you have neuropathy, you can't feel pressure or pain as well. That's a big problem because pain is our guide in so many ways. Um, some people actually say that pain is a blessing, which sounds strange, right? But it can be a blessing sometimes because it tells us when to stop. Um, if you're doing an activity that is causing pain, you're gonna stop doing it. If you can't feel your feet very well, you don't know when to stop that activity and you can actually cause trauma to the foot and not even know that you did it. Many, many, many times I have seen people with puncture wounds on the bottom of the foot. So they'll step on you know, a splinter or a needle in their house or a nail and they don't even know that they've done it. And the only way they came in to see me is it got infected because they had this puncture wound that they didn't know about because they didn't know it was there. They didn't take care of it, not their fault. They didn't even know it was there, but it became infected because it didn't get taken care of properly. And that's when people see a lot of problems. So the lack of sensation is a really big issue for people with diabetes. If you have diabetes and you have a lack of sensation in the foot, it is absolutely vital that your feet get checked on a regular basis.
Um, decreased blood flow, this is also a really big issue. This stems from diabetes. If you smoke, the risk is even higher. You're really just compounding your risk of having decreased blood flow all the way down to the toes. It's going to decrease your ability to heal. So blood has oxygen in it, it has nutrients in it, and it promotes healing. So if you don't have good blood flow, your skin's not getting the oxygen it needs, it's not getting the nutrients it needs, and it's very hard to heal properly and quickly if we don't have good blood flow. Um, so these are kind of how all of these issues on the surface can cause really big issues when they're kind of compounded and not taken care of properly. So this is kind of just a little cartoon picture of what an ulcer kind of looks like. It's just basically a sore or a wound on the foot typically is gonna happen in areas of increased pressure. So you might notice that you have a callus. It looks completely benign. It's just thick skin, no big deal. That callus can actually cause an ulcer because these ulcers are um, caused by increased pressure. So you're getting the callus because you're putting excess pressure on the foot and underneath, deep inside, you're starting to break down the tissue deep inside. And eventually when you pull that callus off, you're gonna pull it off and there's gonna be a wound under there. And that's, that's a pretty big problem. So we actually recommend that if you have diabetes and you have calluses, you should get those calluses actually shaved down by a doctor because it can prevent you from getting a wound as well. So the number one thing you can do if you have diabetes is to control your sugars. Having high sugars is toxic to the body. It's going to increase complications in the body and it's going to make your complications worse. Um, looking at your feet every day is a great way to prevent a problem, especially if you don't have very good feeling in the feet. Look in between your toes, look for cuts and scrapes, look for redness, look for drainage that happens on your socks. All these things are a really good way to catch things before they become a really big problem. You always wanna wear shoes. Um, it's not a great idea to go barefoot. Always wanna protect your feet. Um, don't place your feet in extreme temperatures. Um, so this is when those warm Epsom salt baths actually can be bad. If you don't have very good feeling in the feet, I have seen people burn themselves because they use water that is way too hot and they don't have very good feeling. So it feels just warm to them and they come in with burns on their skin. So you're not gonna to wanna to place your feet in any extreme temperature, whether cold or hot, because sometimes we just don't have very good feeling to know if the temperature is extreme. If you have an injury or a cut and you have diabetes, you're gonna to wanna to seek treatment from your foot doctor and just make sure that it's not something more serious. Anything that's red, if the skin feels warm to the touch, if you get swollen, those are all signs of an infection or something deeper going on, and you're gonna to wanna to see your foot doctor immediately for anything that looks like that. Other ways to prevent problems when you have diabetes. If you have diabetes, you should be seen at least once a year for a thorough foot evaluation by a foot doctor. If you are low risk for having issues in the foot, once a year is perfectly fine. But if you're higher risk, which is somebody with not very good blood flow or somebody who can't feel their feet very well, you need to be seen more often than once a year. There's a lot of people with diabetes out there that are high risk and they don't know it and they don't have a foot doctor. And the first time I meet them is when they have a really big problem and we're talking about possibly cutting off some of their toes because um, we weren't able to prevent it early enough. So if you have diabetes, see somebody, get a foot exam at least once a year, and it should be a thorough you know, foot exam. They should be checking in between your toes and looking at all the skin edges. It shouldn't just be this you know, super quick thing. Um, so once a year, definitely. They should be checking your sensation to see how good, you, good a feeling you have in the foot. They should be checking your circulation and they should be evaluating your shoe gear. So that's how you know that you have had a good foot exam. Um, definitely work with your doctors, inform them if anything seems wrong or if something doesn't feel right, let them know. Um, we can't feel everything that you're feeling. So you definitely have to let us know if there's something that seems abnormal 
and we can certainly pay more attention to that. So um, shoe gear recommendations, I get a lot of questions about shoe gear, you know, what types of shoes should I wear? Um, most people are wearing the wrong shoe size. So if you have ever been to a shoe store and you put your foot in that little device and they kind of measure it, you wanna be buying probably a half size bigger than what that's measuring. Um, you're not gonna to wanna to buy shoes that are exactly the size on that device because what you really wanna see is you want your toes to be able to move in the shoe, okay? It shouldn't be so tight that you're not having any movement and you should be able to move them side to side a little bit, a little bit of movement in the toe box. The toe box of the shoe should be wide and there should be a finger's length in between the tip of your toe and the shoe. So it's gonna be a finger length this way, <laughs> if you can see that. So if these are my toes, this is how much space should be between my toes and the tip of the shoe, right? It shouldn't, your toes should not be jamming against the top of the shoe. That's not um, the correct size for you. So I typically recommend a half size bigger than what you measure on that device. Um, sometimes people need a full size bigger than what they measure on that device. Um, for running shoes, I wear a full size bigger than what I measure on that device because I find that my toes kind of hit a little bit if it's a half size bigger. So I employ that rule as well. You just gonna wanna use whatever feels comfortable. And every shoe is different. So you might be like, a size eight in one shoe and then a size nine in another, and that's okay. It's just whatever feels comfortable. Um, if you have improper footwear, you're gonna see that you might have some calluses, blistering, that's a sign of improper footwear. It's a sign of friction and shearing forces on the foot and foot pain. You know, all these things can happen if your shoes are not um, fitting correctly. We usually recommend that you alternate your shoes if you can. Um, a lot of people kind of wear their shoes down. So look at the tread on the bottom. If you flip the shoe over and all of the tread is worn down, it's probably time to get a new pair. Um, we do wanna change these about annually if we can. And if you have two pairs of shoes, you should alternate them a little bit so that you can increase their um, timeline for when they need to be um, replaced. So just some general, um, general care, general hygiene tips for the foot. Avoid smoking. Um, I've definitely seen people that have no medical conditions at all, but they smoke and they have problems in the feet just because of that. Um, smoking constricts blood vessels. It reduces the amount of blood flow you have in the foot. And the foot is far. It's, a, it's far from your heart, okay? So your heart is pumping this blood. It has to go really far down in order to get to the toes. And if you have an issue with circulation, the toes are gonna be the first thing to go because it's a gravity problem. It's the furthest away from the heart. So avoid smoking and avoid things that are going to you know, cause a constriction of blood vessels. Avoid temperature extremes, you know, if you have diabetes again, and avoid going barefoot. And avoiding going barefoot is just good for, I think, anyone in general. Um, I, I avoid going barefoot as well. And I don't necessarily, you know, have diabetes, but it's just a good habit. Um, wash and dry in between your toes as well. So a lot of times people can get some debris and build up in between the toes, or will notice that it's very moist in between the toes. Now things like athlete's foot, fungus loves moisture. It loves moist, warm places, and that's right in between the toes. So you definitely want to make sure that it's dry in between the toes because athlete's foot is gonna just hang out right in between those toes. So you wanna keep them nice and dry, but clean as well. Um, a reminder, trim your toenails straight across. Don't slant them on the sides. If they're sharp on the sides, then you're gonna use the nail file to round those off. Um, don't use sharp tools and the nail edges to clean them. So everyone gets a little bit of dirt under their toenails and fingernails, I totally get that, but you're not gonna wanna go you know, digging for buried treasure. You're just gonna wanna be like pretty conservative with how you're getting that dirt out. <laughs> Um, I've definitely seen issues with that in the past. Moisturizing. 
this is something that many of us are guilty of. I'm guilty of this. Do I moisturize every day? No, I don't. You know, I have to be very honest that I don't do this, but it is important. Um, if your skin is prone to peeling, um, cracking, you need to moisturize for sure, especially in the winters. You know, this winter in particular has been a little bit colder, I think, than previous winters. So I've seen a lot of people with just general dry, cracked feet. You're going to want to moisturize on a daily basis, especially in the winter when that happens, so that you can avoid these um, cracks in the skin. Sometimes these cracks can be pretty deep. They can cause pain, and I have seen them get infected a few times um, when it's not moisturized well. Um, inspect your feet for cuts and blisters. You know, if you notice something abnormal, tell your doctor. Um, shoes, we, you know, we just went over this, but it's just kind of a reminder. Um, I recommend a finger length in between the show, um, I'm sorry, in between your toes and the tip of the shoe. Your toes should not be jamming at the edge of the shoe and you should be able to wiggle them in the toe box. You definitely want to wear a supportive shoe, something with a supportive sole that supports that arch under underneath your foot and then you want to try to replace your shoes once a year. Um, so that was basically all I had for you guys. Um, if you guys have, you know, um, your children, your grandchildren, anybody who's interested in podiatry or in medicine, they can, there's definitely resources for them. We're not a very big profession. So we're always interested in having some youngsters come out. They can always reach out to me if they have questions, but um, this is just a little info website, stepintopodiatry.com. It just helps um, students learn more about the profession. And I've just had a lot of people um, ask about it. So um, if anyone, if any of you guys know people that are interested, that's uh, a resource. Thank you are muted. I am muted, yes. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks very much. So if you guys have questions, um, raise your hand again, uh, either from the participant button or the reaction button. Raise your hand. I see a number of questions. The first one is Lloyd Contract. Uh, thank you, Dr. It was, uh, I enjoyed your quips very much. Uh, but my question is, uh, on the vascular system in your foot, if you have raised blood vessels that you can see uh, from the top of your foot. Is that a cause for alarm or that's just maybe some natural phenomenon that's peculiar to you? Yeah, so um, I'm thinking you're probably talking about the veins, right? Like they're a little blue and they're oh, right. kind of big, right? Right. Yeah, so that's not alarming. Um, that can happen over time. It's actually because the top of the skin gets a little bit thinner as we age, and it makes those veins that are close to the skin more obvious. Um, so it's not necessarily a concern in itself, unless those veins are painful, or if you're experiencing swelling, that can be an indication that maybe those veins aren't working as well as they could be. And that would be something you could see your doctor for. But veins that are just prominent and a little bit more obvious, that's usually from a little bit of thinning skin. So. Oh, so I'm not a blue blood? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you're okay. <laughs> uh, next, we have Bill Monko. Uh, good morning, doctor. I enjoyed your speech mm -hmm. a little bit. It was really interesting. Question for you. You mentioned uh, barefoot. Uh, a few times. I have a question. In the summer, I tend to wear sandals quite a bit. That's not considered being barefooted, correct? That's not considered barefooted. You know, we all wear sandals in the summer. Totally understand. Um, you just want to make sure that, you know, they're doing a good job. Some sandals are better than others. Some are a little bit thicker on the bottom. So if you were to step on something, you would have some protection. Some sandals are like the flip-flop type of sandals, those some of those don't have really any support at all. So if you have a choice, I would definitely go towards a sandal that has a little bit more arch support because there's a lot of them out there. They're pretty fashionable, they're comfortable, and that's definitely what I would deviate towards. But sandals are okay. okay. The plastic ones, uh, any problem with those? You know, the plastic sandals? Like the Crocs, is yeah. that what you're? 
Yes. No problem with that. You know what? Those are actually pretty supportive. Um, believe it or not, you know, um, they do have some arch support and those actually are, they're okay. You could do worse. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, next up, uh, Bob Rosenthal. Yes, um, uh, good morning. I, I saw your note in there about cutting nails straight across. That was news to me. And my question is, why do all the little clippers are built with a natural curve. I assume that was to guide you on how to do it. Good question. You're right, yeah. Um, if I could change the way those were manufactured, I would. Um, so, you know, when you're using those with the curve, that curve is supposed to be right in the center of your nail because your nail is naturally kind of a little bit more like this. So if, you know, technically, if you were to put it right in the center, it should still leave room on the edges. And you'll still probably have a little bit of pointed edges and you'll have to use the nail file to kind of round those off. So um, I agree with you. Those could definitely be engineered better. And you're not the only one. There's a lot of people that say, oh, I just didn't know you had to cut them straight across. But let's just say do the best you can. Um, and if you put that curve right in the center of the nail, a lot of times you're not gonna get, you know, too deep into those corners. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up is Larry, Larry Halsman. Uh, yeah, thank you for the presentation, uh, Dr. Albright. Uh, I have two questions. Um, one is non-diabetic in the house, uh, you say not to walk barefoot. Does that mean uh, to wear uh, shoes or is it, it just as, is, is walking with socks and no shoes the same as barefoot? So if, so there's kind of a caveat to this. If you're in the house, it's okay to walk in socks unless you have an unstable gait. So if you are somebody that has fallen in the last six months or in the last year, you should probably walk in shoes in the house. Um, shoes are a little bit more stable and it has a more supportive structure. And there has been studies that have said people are more balanced and more stable when they walk in shoes. So if you're somebody who's a little unstable on their feet, it's definitely a good idea to walk in shoes more for the stability that they offer. Now, if you've never fallen, you feel pretty good on your feet, pretty balanced, it's okay to you know, be barefoot in the house. Um, but the biggest problem is just falls, I think, that occur inside of the home. And we can prevent falls from happening in the home when people have a good shoe on in the home. Okay, uh, question two. It's not a question, it's, a, it's more a comment and an experience about that uh, extra half size in sneakers. Uh, I've had an occasion uh, playing platform tennis where I made a sudden stop and uh, turns out my um, big toe jammed yeah. against in that extra room. Turns out that it turned purple uh, as if it almost had a fungus. Uh, eventually it fell off and then the new to toenail grew. Um, so I think you have to be, I think you have to be careful about having too much extra space. Now I wear uh, an extra pair of socks to make it a little bit uh, snugger in the fit. And that seems to work much better. Yes, I agree with you. So every shoe is a little bit different. If you go a half size bigger, some shoes are just not going to support you properly and you're going to have this shifting. So in that situation, you might have to, you know, adjust a little bit. Um, if the shoe has laces, you can definitely adjust the laces, make them a little tighter. Um, usually I recommend that the pressure of the laces be here and not in the toe area but more here and that can help the foot from sliding so you're you're absolutely right about that i have had instances where people have kind of slid in a shoe that was a little bit too big so 
you do have to be careful with um, every shoe is a little bit different and you might have to adjust that half size a little bit depending on what shoe you're looking for. I have a question myself. Uh, Stu, I got my, I don't have my hand up because I can't raise the hand, but I do have an. Go ahead, go ahead, Joe. Go ahead, Joe. All right. uh, Dr. Albright, uh, you mentioned uh, over the counter uh, antifungals and uh, moisturizers. Do you have any uh, typical recommendations of which brands? Yes. So for moisturizers, um, Eucerin, actually, like Eucerin Lotion is quite a good moisturizer. They have one that is a thick type of emollient, and that does a really nice job. That's more just basic um, skin care. If you have really like thick, dry skin, there is a cream called Urea. It's spelled U-R-E-A, and it comes in different concentrations. You're gonna to wanna to get 40% at least. Um, these are available over the counter, but you typically have to buy them more online because I don't, I can't say I've seen them on the shelf very often, but Urea Cream does a wonderful job at getting rid of actually that thick calloused skin that some people deal with. And it's a very good uh, moisturizer and it's safe for skin that's even not calloused. And that does a really nice job. So. Um, those are two good moisturizers. Aquaphor? Aquaphor is great. Yeah. I've had uh, many people use Aquaphor. It's great. Yeah. Okay. And the uh, antifungal OTCs? Yeah. So the antifungal, um, are you looking for something for the toenail or more like an athlete's foot? Uh, toenail. So for the toenail, we usually do um, <laughs> clotrimazole is the name, <laughs> um, kind of a long name, but you know, a lot of those over-the-counter antifungals, you're gonna wanna look for a solution. So some of them come in a cream or a lotion. Those are more for the skin. And even though they have antifungal properties, it's just not as easy to use on the toenail. So you're going to be looking for something that's a solution or even a gel so that you can place that on the nail plate and it'll actually stay intact. So clotrimazole is a frequent one that we offer. Um, I also give out Penlac. Um, fungi nail is, you know, kind of a silly name, but actually we've had some pretty good success with that. Um, there's a, quite a few over-the-counter ones that are pretty good, but I would say air more towards the solutions or the gels. And those seem to work better than the creams and the lotions if you're talking about a toenail. And then I have just one uh, other question. Uh, socks. Yeah. Some of us don't have thin ankles and they're, you know, heavy calves and ankles and tight socks, but at the end of the day, uh, cause almost like somebody with the uh, swole, you know, water on the ankle, you know, on their feet, but uh, is, that, is that okay? I mean, anything wrong with the, that? Because you, you know, you can't find socks with the, the wide band. Yeah, so that's, um, so people that have swelling in the ankle or in the foot, we actually recommend a tighter sock um, because it can help get some of the swelling out. So if you have swelling on both sides and it's pretty symmetrical, a lot of times that's just because the veins are not bringing the blood back up as good as they used to, okay? It's usually not like a severe you know, medical condition, but it can be annoying because you'll have some swelling in the feet. That's when we usually recommend compression socks, which are tighter. And we recommend that people put them on first thing in the morning because first thing in the morning is when the swelling is the least and you wear them all day and then you take them off in the evening and the swelling should be down. Um, that's kind of the idea behind those. So kind of long story short, yes, tighter socks are okay, especially if you have swelling. Yeah. Um, it's actually a recommendation that we do well, recommend well, yeah, a little bit. I mean, I don't have swelling, but it's just the, 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 the band at the top of the sock, you know, that elastic band that compresses that area. 
And, you know, 10 minutes after taking it off, uh, you know, everything's back to normal. Gotcha. Yeah, there's not really any harm in that. It's just going to be if it leads to some discomfort. Um, you could go with a sock that's lower, like maybe an ankle length sock instead of up to the calf level if it's a little bit thinner in that area. But I agree, it's hard to find mm -hmm. socks that don't have that band right over them. And it causes that rain to kind of hang out around the leg. I, I think I know what you're talking about. There's yeah. no um, danger to that. It's mostly just discomfort. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> sure. Hey, uh, Joe, uh, just to let you know, um, I had a similar thing, but I found on the Amazon socks with not a tight band at the top. Well, they have diabetic socks, too, that are looser on the top. Uh, yeah. But I think they're pretty cheap anyway. Um, anyway, uh, Doc, I have a question or two. Um, right. I've had a situation where I got pain in my heel and the doctor called it plant or something or other fasciitis. fasciitis can you tell us something about that and how, how that happens yes so plantar fasciitis is uh. inflammation of a ligament on the bottom of the foot and that ligament's job is to hold your arch up and it also connects to the heel so it causes heel pain that's kind of where it lives back at the heel um, that is typically caused by tight calves actually, <laughs> when the calf muscles are a little bit tight and you know, you can have a flat foot, you can have a high arched foot and you're going to be susceptible to getting it, you know, either way. And I'm going to tell you, 90% of people get better if they do two things with plantar fasciitis. And those two things are that the first thing is a good arch support. That ligament supports the arch. So if you wear a good arch support, you're taking pressure off of that ligament, you're allowing it to do less work and it gets a little happier. So a good arch support is really essential. Now that can either be a good shoe or an insert that you put into the shoe. There's some really good over-the-counter inserts. Um, one is called Super Feet. You want something that's a little bit firm and rigid. So the Dr. Scholl's that are gels, those aren't good because they're not going to hold you up. You need something that, you know, structurally is holding you up. So you want like a firm insert. So that's one thing. The second thing is, is good stretching exercises. If you stretch out your calf muscle, like put a towel over um, the toe and kind of stretch the toe back with the towel, or you do some of the runner's exercises where you're stretching out that calf, 90% of people are gonna get better when they do those two things. Good, thank you. I see uh, Jerry Krantz. Yeah, hi. Um, just wondering if you have any suggestions for good balance exercises to increase one's stability. Ah, so um, Tai Chi is wonderful for balance. Um, there's medical proof that it works for balance. It's very slow movements, which is wonderful, but it really does a wonder increasing the balance. Um, so if you ever have an opportunity to do Tai Chi, I want to say that some of the public libraries actually offer Tai Chi. I don't know if they're doing it anymore because of the pandemic, but I actually do Tai Chi online um, because it's actually relaxing as well. Um, but there are balance um, programs in Tai Chi and it does a really great job. You know, another thing is physical therapy. Um, anyone can walk off the street and walk into a physical therapist's office if it's a private physical therapist. And that therapist can give you about 10 sessions without a referral from a doctor. So if you wanted to have a therapist give you a consult and show you balance exercises, they could definitely do that. And I have referred many, many, many people for balance training to therapy. But um, some things you can do at home. So it's kind of, it's a little bit hard to do this at home, but one thing that I recommend for people that are a little bit unstable in the ankle area is if you stand in the corner of the room, so at the corner of two walls, you wanna stand next to two walls because you don't wanna fall when you do this. But if you stand on one leg 
that's actually pretty hard to do. <laughs> and you are engaging your ligaments and your muscles all around the ankle to try to stabilize you to do that. And if you just practice that next to a wall and hold onto the wall, cause you know, please don't fall when you do this. Um, it, you can really improve your balance. Um, I actually recommend that to even my athletes who have had an ankle sprain in the past, their balance is really poor after that injury and they employ that kind of exercise and it really helps them. But um, Tai Chi is really great and you can always walk into a physical therapist's office without a referral and get a consult for a balance training. Now, this is Steve. I'm going to interrupt because I can't raise my hand either. But the Senior Center offers uh, videos online of Tai Chi classes. They're free. Good. I have one last question that we'll end. Um, doctor, uh, you mentioned athlete's foot and the dryer toes and all that kind of thing. How does one actually catch athlete's foot? Oh, man. You know, just being alive. Um, <laughs> the first base management. <laughs> it's so common. Um, you know, these fungus are just kind of present everywhere, but typically it's going to be a moist, warm place. So saunas, gyms, swimming pools, um, you know, walking around barefoot um, on the beach. I've heard of people getting it, you know, after they were <laughs> walking just on the boardwalk at the beach. It's really going to be when you are barefoot anywhere around other people you're kind of gonna be exposed to it. Definitely not your fault or anyone's fault because it's just so common. But the good news is it's pretty easy to get rid of with over-the-counter creams. So that's when the cream is really helpful. And typically after two weeks of using the cream pretty persistently on a daily basis, you can get rid of the athlete's foot. So basically you're catching other people's athlete's foot. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't see any more questions, so thank you very, very much. It was extremely it was a pleasure. Yeah, good. Thank you, and it was extremely uh, interesting and helpful. I think to uh, for a lot of us. So um, again, thanks for joining us, and um, I'll turn the program back over to Joe. Thank you, Stu. Thank you, Dr. Albright, for a very uh, all-encompassing uh, presentation on the fleet. And uh, I think we all gained something from it. Uh, so, uh, with that, uh, I want to uh, implore everybody to uh, stay safe, stay well, and we'll see everyone next week. Thank you for attending today's meeting. Bye bye. <laughs>